Um, welcome to the Douglas County Chamber of Greystone Power Luncheon. Um, I am Kira Pearson with Greystone Power and your chair-elect of the Chamber Board. Um, I would like to invite at this time Pastor Steve McFall with Central Baptist Church to come forward and lead us in our invocation and pledge. I have one member in my fan club. <laughs> Great to see our chamber family today, and so let's uh, join together in prayer. Lord, today we're just so grateful, Lord. The weather always just reminds us, God, of your greatness and your might, God. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for providing, God, a community that we can thrive in and grow in, a community in which we can join together and take care of those, Lord, who are less fortunate than we are, God, to show them your love and your care. Lord, we thank you for our business community, Lord. We just pray, God, that today that your blessings would be poured out upon every business in the Douglasville Chamber of Commerce, Lord. Uh, today, Lord, we continue to pray for those who are uh, just putting their lives back together from the hurricanes, Lord. Uh, for those, Lord, who are even preparing for maybe even more storms. We pray, God, as we pull together to help people all across our nation, God, that we would, uh, we would do that as you have taken care of us. We thank you for the food and how you've provided that for us and for the hands that have prepared it, Lord. And we thank you most of all, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag? Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, at this time, I would like to invite our luncheon sponsor, Melanie Kagan, Regional Director of the Northwest Region of United Way, to come forward and to say a few words. I'm not that tall, even in heels, sorry. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you guys for having us today. We're very excited to be here. Um, as Kara said, my name is Melanie Kagan. I am the Northwest Regional Director for the United Way of Greater Atlanta. I'm very happy to be here, very excited to just share some information with you um, and to introduce our speaker for today. Whitney. Um, first of all, I'd like to just say a quick thank you to our board. We have an advisory board in Douglas County that helps us with all of the work we do here. So uh, my board members that are in attendance today, if you'll please just stand and be recognized quickly. Thank you. All right, thank you. And to my staff who's here today as well for helping me set this up. They are sitting at that front table. Wave. My staff. Thank you guys. <laughs> Whitney. <laughs> All right. So United Way of Greater Atlanta has a lot of information to share, and a lot of you have been part of it for a long time. Um, we have been in Douglas County for a while. I know a lot of you have companies that participate with United Way. Um, you guys are on our board. You do volunteerism with us, and you're very familiar with the message. But for those of you who aren't, I'm going to share some information with you today about United Way of Greater Atlanta as a whole and um, Douglas County before we introduce our speaker. So really, we're going to start with our why. Um, there's really no better indicator of a community's success than the state of its children. Um, if our children are not cared for, if they do not have strong foundations, if they're not given the opportunity to thrive, then the community may not be as successful as we would like to think it is. And definitely our future could be in jeopardy. So at United Way of Greater Atlanta, we have chosen child well-being as our agenda. That is what we focus on for all the reasons that I just mentioned. A community can only be as strong as its next leaders and its next generation. So we've, we've met, developed some measures that are key indicators that we look at across the board that help us determine what the state of those children are. So child well-being is a data-driven approach that utilizes a strong network of close partnerships 
to make impactful investments to improve child well-being. We look at measures in three different categories, and that's what you can see. We have family measures, community measures, and children measures. Those include things as birth weight, um, third grade reading levels, which I'm sure my education folks know all about and why it's so important, um, high school dropout rates and educational attainment, um, anything from health insurance to unemployment rates. Those are all indicators that can tell us the story of the children and the community at large. In Greater Atlanta, you'll see over our 13 counties, we have an overall score of 58.9. So what that means, basically, is that about 500,000, half a million children, are living in areas that have low child well-being scores, meaning they don't have access to some of those things that can really make the difference for them. There's a study that will show you, unfortunately, that the zip code you're born in actually determines sort of your plight in life. And it is very rare for people who are born in zip codes of extreme poverty or extreme adversity to get out of those states. So breaking those cycles is what we look at. So we believe at the United Way that your zip code shouldn't matter and that kids should have the ability to do what they need to do and to be given the resources and tools to do that no matter where they go to school, no matter where they grow up, or no matter what they look like. So if you look at Douglas County in particular, you can see that our scores are actually very similar to the average scores across all 13 counties. So we look very similar to what you would look at if you aggregate all of them, which probably means that we have a really diverse, amazing community because we look just like everybody all together. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting several people here um, through my board and through some of our companies, and if I know anything, I know that the people here in Douglas County are very willing, very committed, and very passionate to making a difference here and to helping their community thrive. So that's what we want to do. United Way is a helper. We're here to help people find ways to get involved. We're here to help the agencies that do the work be better so that we can all move together to tell the story that we want to tell. Go ahead. So some of our key takeaways basically are that we want to create opportunities in the region to improve child, family, and community well-being over the next 10 years. That's our goal. So when we look at that 500,000 number of the children who are living in poverty, we want that to decrease exponentially over time as we look at how to bring agencies and strategic partners together. We use our convening powers to launch strategic plans. Um, we go across sectors through business, through faith, faith communities, through government, um, nonprofits, and we build on our experience with collective impact and the other methods that we can achieve these goals with. Good. Making it happen takes everybody. So it's a collaborative effort. We have to work strategically, holistically, and be innovative in our approaches. Most of you know that what works, or what worked, I should say, 10 years ago, may not work today. So looking at those new things of how we can innovate and use what's here to really propel the work that's happening in our community. We have some amazing things going on in all of our counties, and Douglas is no exception. So how do we capitalize that and make them better and help tell the story differently? So we will get there through engagement in our workplace. We engage with several companies in our community through our workplace campaigns. Um, through our volunteerism, we had a great event. Um, I don't know if anybody was able to attend, but last Friday we did an event at the Brave Stadium for Hurricane Relief. We packed over a thousand personal care bags for people who are experiencing some really adverse reactions to having a storm basically take out everything they have. And we had pallets and pallets of volunteer items that were dropped off and donated um, that we got to send to two different places. We started with Hurricane Harvey <laughs> and halfway through our collection we had to expand our collection for Irma. Um, we had one of our companies bring us 100 cases of water. I don't know if you know what 100 cases of water looks like, <laughs> but it's a lot of water. It was two pallets. Those are the types of volunteerism opportunities we have. We also engage through our affinity groups um, and through local collaboration. So what does that mean for you guys? I know you can sit here and look at the slides and you can hear me talk about it all day, but I'm gonna tell you a story that just embodies what I think United Way stand for and what the work does. I have a child who is now 14, so his story is a little different, but when he was in elementary school, how many of you have elementary school aged children who have agendas? They have an agenda, <laughs> I hear a laugh, yes. 
So the agenda is a dance that we used to do every day because my child would chase me around the house and say, Mom, my agenda, did you sign my agenda? We need to sign the agenda. Did you sign it? Did you sign it? Did you sign it? Mom, did you sign it? Because that was a big deal. The children had to get their agenda signed so that they could prove that somebody at home was paying attention and that they were putting their stuff in front of mom and dad so that I could see that they were doing their work, not doing their work, whatever. They had a class average that they collected and they got points for it and they earned points to get prizes at the end of the week. Elementary school children are driven by prizes. They cost two cents. They want them more than anything in the history of ever. So my child and I would do this dance all the time. My child also had the benefit of going to school at the same school from kindergarten to fifth grade for elementary school. He knew everyone in the school, or so he liked to think he did. And one day we were having a conversation after school and he came to me and he said, Mom, there's this girl. She's at our school, she's new. I know she's new because I've never seen her before. Okay, new girl. What's the story with the new girl? Well, Mom, she's a mess. <laughs> Baby, she's 10. <laughs> How is she a mess? Because I'm thinking mess, hair, clothes, something, I'm not sure. What does a 10-year-old mess look like? Please explain it to me. So my son sits down and he proceeds to tell me and gripe pretty much about how this poor child is never at school on time, how she never has her agenda, which is a big deal. I already explained the agenda. That was his biggest gripe. She doesn't have her agenda. She's bringing down the class average, mom. She's always a mess. Her hair isn't combed. Her homework is a mess. It's never done. Her backpack is stuff, stuffed inside of it. And sometimes she's just never even there. She doesn't even come to school. You wouldn't let me not come to school. How come she doesn't get to come to school? And I had to pause for a second and really consider what I was gonna have this conversation turn into for my child. It was obviously impacting him or we wouldn't have had to stop and talk about it. But for my child, the impact was that he didn't know what her story was. He just knew that she didn't look like the rest of the kids in his class. Something was happening because no 10 year old chooses to be that kind of a mess by themselves. They are subject to whatever it is that's happening around them. So I had to sit and think, and I talked to my son and I said, baby, what if this little girl has a mom who is by herself? And what if she works two or three jobs and she has to leave early in the morning before she gets up and this little girl's getting herself to school through friends or getting herself to the bus? And what if mom doesn't come home till late and there's nobody there to help her not be a mess? I said, or what if she has a little brother who's really, really sick? And mom and dad are spending every night, night after night at a hospital waiting for somebody to tell them if he's going to make it or not. And they're so tired that they can't sign an agenda because they're just not thinking about that right now. I said, or what if she's living with a grandparent because mom and dad aren't able to take care of her? And at 65, running after a 10 year old, is a whole lot different than when you're younger and you're running after your own kids. And he said, oh, okay mom, then I won't call her a mess anymore. And I said, okay, baby, let's not call her a mess because we don't know her story. And to me, that's what the United Way embodies. All of those stories could have be, been true, and they are true. They're true every day for kids in every school system, no matter what you look like, where you live, or how you live. Because illness doesn't care, right? Illness doesn't care if you're rich, if you're poor, doesn't matter. And sometimes things happen that take us off our game. The United Way is there to help in all of those circumstances, to make sure that the children are not just subject to what's happening around them, but that the families have the ability to engage in things that can get them past those hard times, whatever they might be. Because everybody has them, and it can be your neighbor, it can be a coworker, it can be somebody down the street, somebody at church, any of it, and we never know. So that's what the United Way does for me. I believe in what we do because I've seen us wrap communities up and really help lift people when they need it most. So that is what child well-being means to me. And it affects everybody because it could be your kid that has this conversation with you or it could be a coworker that has to have these conversations and we don't know. So the true meaning of philanthropy is to give even when you're never ever gonna necessarily see the person that you're touching with that gift. So thank you to everybody in this audience who has participated with us in the past. Thank you for believing in the work that we do and thank you for wanting to keep us here so that we can continue to do that work. I believe very strongly in what we do here and I'm looking forward to working with a lot of you. So, since we're new to the area, my husband and I just moved here, um, and I came in when we were planning this uh, luncheon. Um, there's no shame in my game. I went ahead and sandbagged my husband to be the speaker. <laughs> um, but, for good reason. <laughs> so I am going to introduce um, our speaker for the day. Maxwell Kagan is Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Wellstar Medical Group. Uh, he has nearly 20 years of experience in audit and healthcare finance. 
he, prior to this, we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he held similar jobs with similar healthcare companies. He's also been in Colorado with similar companies. Um, he has his degree, both of his degrees, from the University of New Mexico back home. He has volunteered for several boards, several committees, nonprofits, um, and I, I think he's a pretty great guy, but that's because we celebrated our anniversary yesterday. So <laughs> please help me welcome to the stage Maxwell Cajun. She's great, isn't she? Um, just to say something about Melanie and the United Way. Melanie had worked for the United Way in New Mexico as well, and uh, yeah, ever since we've been together, I've always been a big fan of the United Way and uh, the programs that they're involved in and how they treat the community and how the community gets involved with the United Way. And when um, you know things are right, when we got the opportunity to come here to the Atlanta area and take this opportunity with Wellstar, the other half of the equation is, well, you know, what was Melanie going to do? And through, you know, good luck, you know, God's will, the right timing, uh, Melanie was able to get on with the, the United Way here after doing an amazing job in Albuquerque with Big Brothers, Big Sisters. So uh, thank you so much for having me here today. So let me tell you how this actually went down with the speaker. Is um, I'm driving home from work one day, and uh, one of the things that's taking quite a bit of adjusting is the traffic here is... Uh, is a very interesting. Some days I leave and I go, I gotta be at work right at eight, so I'll leave at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> no, some days, I mean, it doesn't matter. There's no pattern to it. it. Either you get in in a half hour, or you get in like this morning, an hour and 20 minutes, and I can't explain you why. There wasn't an accident or anything out there. That's, that's the interesting part, and I don't mind it. I don't mind being in the car. I think getting some time in the car and listening to your favorite podcast or listening to music isn't that bad. It gives you some time. Um, to reflect. But um, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time here so far in Georgia. I've been here for a little under five months. Um, getting here, getting into healthcare, getting with Wellstar, being involved with a nonprofit healthcare system, being able to use my field of study in finance and operations and uh, management, and being able to immediately contribute to the community. So back to what we were saying before, I'm driving home in traffic and I get a call and it was, you know, don't be, you know, hey, don't be mad, but I've got an idea and I was, I thought something like we rearranged something for the 15th time inside the house and it was, would you be our guest executive speaker at this luncheon uh, that we're having? And I said, absolutely. Because uh, where we came from before in Albuquerque, we were frequently involved in our community. But one of the things Melly and I are passionate about is making sure we contribute to the communities in which we live in. And so when she was telling me about this in work, um, I was so excited to be here today to share a little bit about my perspective on how the business community needs to interact with the greater community at whole and contribute um, its either time, its talent, or its treasure. That's something you'll hear time and time again. It's kind of cliche, but we know that that's what it's going to take in order to move the dial on some of the things around childhood well-being. You know, so, so far here in Atlanta, one of the differences between the West and uh, down here in the South is just something small, and I love it, and you guys are going to laugh at me, but I love Quick Trip. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I walk in, this is a clean gas station with soda as far as the eye can see, and I'm just filling up tea and making slushies, and the kids are, they're happy, and, I, and then I love pretzels with cheese, and I'm not going to lie. <laughs> And I didn't know there's a place where you can get gas, you can get whatever soda on planet Earth and a hot pretzel with cheese and walk out the door and the people are really nice to you? Are you kidding me? These places should be everywhere. That was in the first week. So you can imagine, I'm going to be amazed by everything else. So when I, when I, when I was able to go to the, uh, the new Falcon Stadium, you can imagine how crazy I might have gotten if I was satisfied by a simple quick trip. But Atlanta, Georgia is an amazing place. Um, I first visited here in 2001. I was stuck here for September 11th for work when I was working with Arthur Anderson. Got to know the area really well because I was supposed to leave uh, on the Wednesday after that horrible day and ended up leaving on that Friday. So I got nothing but time and everybody was so great. And what I'd always wondered is, you know, the Olympics was here. I wonder what's Atlanta all about? And I had three or four subsequent trips 
thereafter in 2001. And if you would have told me in 2017 that I'd be living here today and being part of this great community, I thought you were crazy. But I am, uh, my wife and I are so glad to be here. Everybody's been uh, so great, and I can't wait to contribute uh, even more. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, just giving some perspective of why childhood well-being and the business community need to team up together uh, to make sure that we tackle this before it becomes a real, real large problem and what we can do uh, together. And we use that term, it takes a village, and it really does. Let me take you back to one quick story about myself. So uh, coming up on about, uh, it'll be 11 years this December, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. June of 2006. I was given six months of chemotherapy and one month of radiation. It was crazy. I was only 29 years old at the time. And to get that diagnosis of knowing that pretty healthy guy, having made a bunch of bad life choices, and then to get told you have cancer, it was crazy. And then what they ended up doing was they hit you with the chemotherapy, they hit you with the radiation, and during that time, you just get progressively sick, and then you, know, you get, eventually get better. And I'm glad that I'm standing here today almost 11 years uh, uh, to the date. Appreciate it. But what I, what, now that I've had time to reflect on that process, I remember being so confused and a little bit angry because everybody, all of a sudden, friends and family just really, really, really wanted to help me. And me being like kind of a guy's guy, so I go, I don't need help, I don't need help with that, I don't need help with this. But I realized these people were saying, no, you do need help, or I want to do this for you. And it wasn't because they felt guilty. That was the way I thought it was as well. These folk people feel guilty and they're just helping me and I'm just a piece of No, it was they wanted to be generous. And they knew that I, I was somebody that was in need. And they went above and beyond. Whether it was a meal, whether it was just hanging out, they knew that I was sick, but I was too, had too much pride um, to say so. And by what they did of having their time spending with me, an adult, by going and doing something for me when not asking and being generous with their time, being generous with taking care of something for me, that meant a lot to them because generosity for me is the only way I really believe you can be truly fulfilled. You know, it, it's not going to come down to how much we get paid at the end of the day. It's not going to be what we do or, hey, you hit that sales target. It's going to be what we leave as a legacy. What did our life mean when it was all done? We're all going to have a career. We're all going to enjoy our jobs. We're all going to have different jobs. We're all going to have good days and bad days where we work at. But it's really going to be what we did with our families, what we did for others within the community is where we're going to leave our legacy. That's where people are going to remember most about us when it's all said and done. And I think this is a unique opportunity here today to contribute to the future of not only greater Atlanta area, but the society as a whole. So there's three points I want to hit on today. One would be the idea and the concept of a social contract and the investments that organizations need to make within their community. And then there's two things that I think are highly overlooked when we're talking about how we interact day to day as leaders and how we can contribute to the community. And that's the idea of macro patience versus micro speed and the idea of the five people you or your children or others people, children, spend the most time with and how that shapes their lives. So the social contract investment. Social contract, by definition, is a voluntary agreement in which mutual benefit occurs between individuals, groups, government, or community as a whole. And to, depending on what theory you subscribe to, an organized society is brought to into being and invested with the right to secure mutual protection. And that's what we need to do for children. I cannot think for a better way for this business community to honor and live that concept of the social contra uh, contract by investing in the future and the well-being of children. Investing in children can help promote equitable and inclusive societies, allow more people to effectively participate in the economic development because childhood is a unique window of opportunity. Investments in children help create a level playing field. And here's my definition of a level playing field. We can all agree, or I hope that you agree, is that some children are born with a leg up, whether that be through wealth or opportunity or the family they're in, or as we've learned, and I've learned from Melanie, just simply the zip code that you live in could affect what level you're playing on the playing field. So my idea of a level playing field isn't bringing others down to level it out this way. It's 
Are we building la proverbial ladders and bridges and roads and doing whatever we can to lift these folks up to making sure that we could all be on that same level playing field to making sure that the children of the next generation, if they have innovative ideas, if they have a different way of thinking, if they want to be involved in um, community service, if they have a business idea, that we have the opportunity to funnel that through. I've seen it time and time again where children that are smart, they don't know that they're not born in the right zip code. They don't know that maybe parents have made bad choices in the past. They don't know that. But it's sown in very early on. They have interests. They have beliefs. They have things that they want to pursue. They have dreams. And then life kind of narrows things down for them. But what if the, the dollar we invested today, or the thousand dollars we invested today, something allowed one or two of these kids to open up those dreams a little bit further. All children, I believe, should have access to essential health, educational, and nutritional requirements, those basic needs that are being met. Our goal would be to have these investments pay off to allow more equal and access to better jobs later on in life, improve the productivity for the businesses that you guys run today, and create this rainforest effect for the edu educated individual to get the same opportunity to just show their best or in how I, how I try to push my folks as a leader is to go beyond your best. Get a bigger vision for what you want to do uh, for your life. You know, I've talked to kids and stuff before, um, even my own kids, and talked to them. And, uh, you know, they have a kind of these, sometimes they have just a small vision. I always just try to get them to think a little bit bigger for what they want to do. You know, um, folks that I've had the opportunity, I think one of the, uh, you know, it's me being personal for a second. I view one of my biggest responsibility are the people that are put in my charge. You know, uh, right now at Wellstar, I have uh, several direct reports, and they have several direct reports at all levels of their career. And I look at one of my big responsibilities is what can I do to make sure that I leave a lasting impact on that person to where I can lead them to think beyond where they're thinking today. That, you know, taking a manager and saying, hey, here, you know, you'd make a great director one day, or you'd do really great over here. Not that I'm pushing you away, that's something you need to think about. And they're not thinking about that for themselves. And as a business community, we need to make sure that we understand people and we're encouraging people. And that goes down at a child level as well, is we need to get kids to think and have a bigger vision for their lives and always keep after those things. And don't let those setbacks that they might have as children throw them off of their uh, dreams and that they need to be thinking in the macro terms later on down the road. Furthermore, because the most vulnerable groups in society might not be able to make the optimal investments on their own, there's a strong rationale for business to make investments in social sectors related to children, especially when it's aimed at those most in need. And the benefits far outweigh the costs. Repeated studies found that investments at more educated societies benefit everybody in them. And although there might be some time between when the investments are made and when we actually get the payoff, the gains can be significant and long-lasting. The United Way of Great Atlanta has chosen to be the mechanism to enact real long-lasting prosperity for children and to bend the statistics that might not be pointing in the right direction and to make the greater Atlanta area an amazing place to be an exceptional child, which will make this area an ex exceptional place to live for years to come. Through businesses, volunteers, donors, governments, foundation partners, the United Way is going to work to improve the living situations for all. Where, when I was looking into this, I realized how much number crunching went on. And as, from a finance standpoint, United Way has crunched all the numbers. They have the right monitoring statistics. So as we make these investments over time, whether they're people investments or their money investments. We know what numbers are going to have to move up in time as a community to making sure that, that we are successful. And I believe in this cause. I think this is going to be amazing. And I would love and encourage all of us to take action, whether that, again, is contributing through time, talent, or treasure. And children's well-being is not a business. Um, and I like to make the joke, and Melanie and I were laughing about this the other day, is uh, you know we can't fire our kids from our family can't terminate them. Now, I know you're all thinking, that's a really good idea. <laughs> but you know, you can't, walk, you can't walk in at home and be like, uh, you know, hey, uh, Billy, um, would you mind ha stepping into my office over here? And Billy kind of walks up and, you know, we talked about your performance last time. And on August 3rd, 16th, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, your homework and your grades. And grades aren't there, so we're going to go ahead and uh, gonna give you a severance package, you know, return you back. We can't do that. 
We'd like to, believe me, but we can't. And that, that means we can't, we, it, we also, in the bigger family of our society and our community, we can't just kind of kick the kids out of the community, the ones that are struggling along. We need to give them the unconditional love we'd give to our own family members as, as well. Why it's, why it's cliche and easy to say that children should all be treated with respect, the numbers would show we have a great deal of work to do in order to keep our promise to the children. There are four ways that I believe investing in children can have a big payoff in our community. One, it can prevent the achievement gap. Gaps in knowledge and the ability between disadvantaged children and the more advantaged peers op opens up l long before kindergarten. You know, I was really interesting, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, but some of those early childhood development experts, I mean, there's almost like 80% of what the, a child, you know, their mind is really between two and five. What investments can we make there in that early childhood education Knowing those statistics, we have all the numbers, we know what to do, we just need the time of people that are willing to be passionate about this, or we need the monies from folks to be passionate about this as well so we can invest there. Taking a proactive approach to cognitive and social skills and development through these investments in early quality childhood education is more effective and economically efficient than trying to close these gaps later on down the road. It's all in the statistics, we know the path that we need to take. Second, it can improve health outcomes. Working for Wellstar or having worked in healthcare now for almost 20 years in nonprofit healthcare, I have seen every presentation, I have seen every type of disease that's out there, I've seen how you get these things paid for, I've seen hospitals grow, I've seen technology come along, but one of the things that we neglect is that healthy habits, the healthy outcomes, the stress, the mental issues that develop early on with kids are something that we can prevent. We can bend the curve, as we like to say. I mean, recent research has shown that there are dramatic long-term health effects of early, interve early interventions in disadvantaged children that incorporate the new education, nutrition, and overall health and well-being. These findings demonstrate the great potential of coordinated birth to age five early childhood programs to prevent chronic disease, and overall reduce healthcare costs. That's one of the investments we're gonna get. Now, I don't know how many of you in here deal with the budgets around health insurance within your particular firms, whether you're small business, medium-sized business, or work for a large corporation. The single business, biggest expense that's holding back corporate America overall, if you ask them, is the cost of healthcare and the cost of providing benefits to their employees. Wouldn't it be amazing in a future if we could bend that curve? Now, it doesn't mean healthcare costs going down to some ridiculous amount. It means the rate at which the healthcare costs are growing are not sustainable over a long period of time. Can we bring that more in line with inflation or more in line with something that's less than the sales growth within our organization? One of the things uh, Wellstar struggles with right now, or we have to think about, not struggles with, but we have to think about, is the rate at the, our revenue and growth that we bring in to maintain our mission and our nonprofit status, make an economic profit so we continue to grow in areas just like Douglas or in, in Atlanta, is that the rate of taking care of our own employees, that expense is growing faster than any other expense that we have. And so we've got opportunity there as well. And I bet that your businesses, if you looked into that today when you got back, uh, would be the same. The third point here is that investing in children early on can boost earnings. Uh, studies have been published by top researchers from all over the world that have, that have found that extremely disadvantaged children who took part in early interventions similar to home visit programs in the United States boosted their earnings in adulthood by 25% putting their wages on par with those of the more advantaged peers. So again, we have the data. What can we do with that data? How can we be innovative? Can you contribute your time? Can we get the money that's necessary to hire the experts and get the right people in place to help out the disadvantaged and get that level playing field? The 25%, I bet if we boiled that down to, that could be the difference between somebody either dropping out in high school or just completing high school or somebody going from high school and going all the way to college and there was some sort of early intervention that happened from zero to five or five to ten that made the difference between that and we can't see that now but we'll be able to definitely see it in the future and um, I'm, I'm a big kind of economic guy and I tried to look up some information and research what is the overall rate of return so the rate of return on investments in quality early childhood development or early quality childhood 
interventions, whatever they may be, for disadvantaged children is 7 to 10 percent a year. There's a growing recognition of the value of investing in these programs, and it's time to act on all of that evidence. The sooner we do this, the more likely we're going to put our area on a greater road to prosperity that is shared by all. I am so excited about living here right now, and I know this is a great community. When you look at those statistics, it's going to be about how do we keep this a great community? How do we keep what's going on in this great city or in this great part of the country going? If we neglect these data points, if we neglect these statistics, there is a possibility that you can lose years. You know, uh, where I come from in New Mexico, uh, the recession in 2008 already hit a community that was in decline even harder. And so from 2007 to 2017, right where I left, uh, we were at a presentation where we saw they're calling it the lost decade because there was zero job growth, zero growth in the population of the state over that time from an economic standpoint. And because the warning signs in 2004, 2005, 2006 were not taken seriously and proper investments were not made, the state and the economy there has lost an entire decade. And it's right at the turning point where it might lose another decade if kind of emergency procedures are not put in place. That's in stark contrast to coming out here where you see growth every day, construction going on. And we complain about you know, the traffic. The traffic will solve itself in the long term. There are innovative ideas. Uh, and it might not happen right away. That's that macro patience I'll talk about here in a second. But you can tell that people are working on it. You can tell there are 10,000 people moving to Georgia every month. We have growth and prosperity. And that's why it's vitally important to make these investments in making childhood great for everybody that moves here. And that's what we're going to do over the long term. So what do I mean by macro patience versus micro speed? Most people have massive goals of becoming successful, whether that's being rich, being super happy. However, I believe very few people are approaching these goals in the correct manner. Most people are applying micro patience and macro speed to, they, to their goals. Um, in the micro to day to day, they're simply being too patient. When they could be reading, studying, working on a kind of a side business, they're instead opting to be patient and take their time, thinking it's just going to happen. The concept of micro speed and macro patience is simple and can be summarized in this quote that I like to use. People overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, but far beyond they underestimate what they can do in five or ten years. And if you think about that simple equation, think about where you were five years ago and could you envision where you're at today? Think about where you were five years b before that and can you envision where you're at today? You know, Melanie and I, when we came here, you know, we've only been here for about four or five months. We come in here and we're going to think, oh my God, we're going to have all these friends right away. We're going to do this right away. We're going to go to everything in town right away. And we're overestimating. And it's, and it's okay to have this. We're going to overestimate what we're going to be able to accomplish in our first year here. But when we're here for five years, we're going to look back and say, this is the best thing we ever did. Look at all these amazing things we did. But we want to make sure we don't get caught up in the micro patience and macro speed. We want to have macro patience and micro speed. So the question is, do you agree with this? And how do you not become this and burn out on this cause? Because this cause right here is, is everything about macro patience and micro speed. The gist, of, the gist of that quote and this idea and its application can be difficult to understand. However, one distinction can be made. That overestimating what you can do in a year does not mean you, can't, you can be lazy thinking things will work themselves out. Macro patience is simple. It's setting long-term objectives that are aligned with what you value, want to achieve in life, what you want to achieve through your passions, or what you want to achieve within your community. You know, think of it this way. If you wanted to build like an amazing physique, not like mine, but if you wanted to build like an amazing physique, you can't go do one workout or a week of workouts and saying, I didn't get there, it didn't work. I mean, it's gonna take years and years and years, and you have to set realistic goals along the way and keep reevaluating them. So the idea around micro speed is that micro speed is the ability to constantly be hustling, maintaining a high level of energy, fast paced, efficient throughout your day. Basically, it's your ability on a daily basis and not occasionally to get things done quickly and efficiently to maximize your productivity throughout the day. This means that short-term, 
you are able to consistently achieve things that will eventually add up to your long-term goals. And childhood well-being is part of that. Is every day we're going to have energy around this. We're going to be committed to this. There are a lot of people in this room that can do very small little things that when we look back on five years, we're going to look to this day or the next day, the day after that, that there was a small decision that was made, there was a small donation that was made, there was a small amount of time that was donated by somebody either in this room or in the companies that you work for or engage with that helped with the overall cause. And in the macro sense, we're gonna be able to get there and achieve our goals. Micro, micro speed, macro patience is what we wanna do. Action for the sake of action is not achievement. Things like cleaning the entire house when you have a different task at hand is a form of procrastination and not an example of micro speed. And I believe it's very important to be able to focus on those important tasks than those secondary ones. Those are things we have to get done. But what are we doing today? What's the little thing we're doing today that's helping us achieve our goals overall? And while today we're talking about childhood well-being, this can be applied to anything that we're doing, whether it's leadership, whether it's our job, whether it's being patient with our own families at home. That idea of micro speed and macro patience, I think, plays a big role in what we're trying to accomplish here. And then the third section is about the community at large. And I call it the five people. Um, and I don't know who we attributed this to or what study, but a long time ago, something, you know, something sort of flashed up on, on maybe, maybe it was Facebook or maybe it was just online somewhere, and I watched this video, and the gentleman was explaining that you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Has anybody else heard that before? Uh, let's see some hands going up. This relates to the law of averages, which is a theory that results from any given situation will be the average of all those outcomes. So salespeople, entrepreneurs, and all successful, successful people know that in order to increase your amount of wins, you also got to increase your losses. Now, I'm not saying we always need to lose, but the more you're out there and playing, the more you're out there and interacting with people, you'll develop your network. And you're really going to be, if you're, you know, I would tell my kids today, if you're hanging out with a bunch of losers, you're probably going to be a loser. If you're hanging out with a bunch of winners, some, there's something about that lifts people up. There's so many stories that we can think about, either from childhood or adulthood, that simply by being in the right place at the right time or hanging out with the right person that maybe gets a big break, that they're going to pull you along with them. I've had that happen with me before in my career. You know, people that I might have been hanging out with work. They get a job somewhere else, that's a recommendation for me down the road, or it got me uh, work when I was back in my consulting days. There's always something to having that strong network of people. And I think that relates back to children, because when it comes to relationships, we're greatly influenced by those that are closest to us. And uh, you know, while it's ideal to be closely surrounded by positive and supportive people who want to succeed, it's also necessary to have your critics. And where I'm going with this is I want to make sure that through this process, I think it's important in childhood well-being and creating a village that not only do the children have opportunities that they wouldn't have had before through this work that we're doing here, but they get to meet people that are going to be able to shape their futures. We've all had, and we can go around the room and spend hours of these amazing stories of these heroic individuals that were part of that five at some point in time. And that five doesn't have to be stagnant, but we have to be able to teach our children as part of their well-being that it is important who they're connected with. And that hanging out with kind of the, you know, the bad kids, the rough kids, that's not going to lead to good things down the road. So what can we do as their mentors and leaders in the community to facilitate the opportunities for all kids to have ambitions, for all kids to have an opinion on an issue and be able to share those uh, opinions with each other to build each other up as opposed to tearing each other's down? While today's forum is not to speak about the pros and cons of technology and how it can help or hurt our children, we must be mindful that technological advances are here to stay and have broken down many barriers, not only for us, but for children as well. <clears throat> we all like to think that, oh, you know, in the good old days, you know, we just had bikes and, you know, we didn't have cell phones and any of these other things. But the smartphone that we have in our pocket that everybody's in here today that you might be on during a meeting that you check during your board meetings at work or check it on your drive home when you shouldn't be and paying attention to Atlanta traffic, that stuff is here today. 
So through this process of childhood well-being, how do we use technology in this process? And this is something I'm also passionate about. These things are here to stay. They're getting better every day. They've changed our lives. I can order a pretzel on Quick Trip right now, and in 15 minutes from now, I can drive right by and pick it up, and again, have somebody tell me uh, something friendly. Uh, did you ever think you'd live in a world where I was able to hold up my phone like some sort of overlord and hit a button and a car would just magically appear right in front of me and take me anywhere I want for like $5? I never thought that would happen. Or Amazon, who we think and hope will build another uh, second headquarters here at some point in time. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that would be very interesting. We're at the touch of the button. The other day, I'll give you an example. Melanie walks up to me and says, uh, Leah needs, uh, Leah's our uh, daughter, Leah needs a specific pair of pants. I found them on Amazon. She sent it over my phone. I hit a button. I hit boom. It's shipped. It is sitting on her front porch right now. That is amazing. But the kids are and I hate to use the word addictive, but the kids, the, their attention here is at the phone. That's how they're interacting today. And there's a lot of good things about that, and there's a lot of bad things about that as well. So how do we leverage technology in this process to promote children well-being? That would be part of the innovative process. That's what's exciting to me is what is going to come out of this process that's going to lead to a technological breakthrough that's going to help children be better on down the road. It could be just by giving them the device. You know, if you, it's going to be if you don't have a device, you're going to be left out. You know, a lot of children are left behind in education these days because they do not have access to the technology that other folks have. What can we do to fill in that gap here? I think that's important. So in summary, I, 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 I'm really glad and truly honored to be here today. I hope I get to meet everybody in this room at some point in time, I, and I really hope if you uh, come to a Wellstar facility, whether it be in the medical group or in a hospital, that you and your family have a truly amazing experience and that you know somebody now that works there. And one of the other things I, I love about my role is being able to help people if they've had a bad experience or what I love even more is if they have had a great experience, give me those names because I'll tell you, nothing makes a person's day more than being able to write an anonymous email or letter to their boss or supervisor saying, these three people helped this person have an amazing experience or their family was taken care of by us. That's why I'm in uh, healthcare. I've had many people walk in my life as a kid, a teenager, and as an adult who've had a profound effect on me. I consider myself very, very lucky, and I'd ven I'd, I would venture to imagine others would feel just as lucky. We can only imagine what our society can be become. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember a friend from your youth that you've lost contact with, or someone smart from your past and wonder what they're doing today? I remember that children I was friendly with in my youth have had difficult times as an adult, some from poor life choices, some simply because of the choices of others, and some because opportunities or access were not made accessible to them in some shape or form. And I'll leave you with this. You can be happy because of the things you do at work. You can be proud because of the things you accomplish at work. You can be excited because you had a big success at work, but you know how you feel fulfilled at work when you do something for somebody else. It's the only way to get that feeling. The only way to get fulfilled is by doing something for someone else. And you can debate me all day, and I'll respect everybody's opinion, but that's my truth, is that when you do something for somebody else, that's the way you feel fulfilled. You know why the statistics say over 90% of the people don't feel fulfilled by the work they do? It's not because of the job. It's not because of the pay. It's not because of the benefits. It's because we don't help each other anymore. Far too often, we're sitting in our cubes and we work. When we turn to somebody, it's because we need it. Let me grab this piece of paper from you. It's because we need something. We don't put ourselves out there simply for no other reason than to help somebody else. You know what generosity is? Generosity is doing something for somebody else and expecting nothing in return. So going back to before, when people came out uh, when I was sick, it was their generosity. They didn't expect me at some point to, oh man, when I'm sick, oh, you better remember this. No, it was simply to be generous with expecting nothing in return and getting that glorious and amazing feeling. So within the next weeks, days, or months, if you are able to be generous, whether it's with your time or your money, you'll get this amazing feeling that you can get in no other way. Make this about them, the children, and not about you. The fact of the matter is 100% 
of customers are people. 100% of clients are people. 100% of employees are people. And I don't care how good our products are. I don't care how good our marketing is. I don't care how good our design is. If we don't understand people, if we don't invest in children, then we don't really understand business. I believe our success in this community has already been written. We will continue to improve the lives of children. We will understand that they might overestimate, we might overestimate our capabilities in the short term, but we'll underestimate the long and lasting impact that we will have. And through discipline, patience, love, and financing, there's no doubt in my mind we will be successful. United Way, along with many, many other partners, has developed a strong set of measures that this community can use to assess how its children and the family that supports them and the community that surrounds them are doing. This will be able to ensure that we can track progress over time and determine what levers we need to keep on pulling to ensure that all children are doing well. We can all agree on the risks of inaction, as I described before, and we can look at work that is already being done all over the world and apply that knowledge to new ideas here in Georgia with new volunteers, new capital, and new monies, all directed and administered by the great folks at the United Way. Thank you guys so much for your time this afternoon. I really, really appreciate your commitment to this effort. Okay. Um, thanks again to um, Maxwell Kagan for, and Wealth, with Wellstar Medical Group for joining us today and to United Way for sponsoring today's luncheon, and to Greystone Power for their naming sponsorship. And I hope you all have a great day.